In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. So nice to be with you here. This is episode 107. We've been going strong here for over two years, and we couldn't do it without your help, without your support. Uh, If you want to learn about how you can uh, become a supporter of our program, you can go to our website, veracityhill.com, and click on the patron button. tab there. I also want to mention uh, an app that I discovered this week called Marco Polo. It's a video walkie-talkie app, and so uh, really neat. I know a couple buddies that are already on it. What we're going to do is we're going to set up a Veracity Hill Marco Polo group, and so if you are one of our regular supporters, you'll get access to this group where you can send me messages, and I'll reply back to you, Uh, and so it'll be a a great little way that our supporters can come together and just ask each other questions about uh, topics pertaining to our episodes. Uh, Or maybe if you want to request a guest or some topic, uh, it'll help our program in terms of the, uh, the, the content creation, the ideas, the brainstorming for what we're doing here. Um, All right, well, uh, just one um, other announcement here before we get going on today's program. Uh, We're um, two months away from the annual Defenders Conference, and this year's theme is genocide. Uh, Did God really command uh, the Israelites to kill uh, the women and the children? So how should Christians understand these difficult passages? There are many verses that talk about this, and there are different Christian perspectives on it as well, on how to interpret these passages. So we are bringing uh, into Chicago land some of the those that have written on this topic. Uh, Dr. Paul Copan, Dr. John Walton, who's a local at Wheaton College, Dr. Clay Jones, and Dr. Kent Sparks, uh, all of whom have had an interest in presenting their interpretation on how Christians should understand these passages. So we're going to leave it up to you, the audience, on what you should think about these different perspectives and what you uh take away from those verses, and then how you can apply that into your conversations with people that use that against, uh, that use that as an obstacle for uh, faith in Christ. Uh, So, on today's program, we're talking about demolishing arguments, uh, and why are we doing this? Well, it's sort of been an unofficial series. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, I had Braxton Hunter on the show. We talked about evangelistic apologetics where we talked about the importance of incorporating the gospel message in how we defend the faith. If we just defend the faith and we just talk about these propositions, but we never encourage people to accept the propositions and assent to them, really have it marinate in their life so that they they take Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they repent from their sins, then what are we doing? Uh, So, That was two weeks ago. Last week, we had Ted Wright on our program, and we talked about um, how students and parents can be prepared, um, especially for this upcoming school year. So it was very much on the edification of believers. And um, so today's episode is on demolishing arguments and the importance of uh, engaging with those who don't believe. Well, where does this concept of demolishing arguments come from? It sounds a little bit, uh, you know, not quite the Jesus loving type. Well, I'll tell you what, 2 Corinthians 10 5 is where this comes from. Paul, his second letter to the church at Corinth, he writes, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So that's where this concept of demolishing arguments comes in. But also there, there's that second part, taking every thought captive uh, for Christ. Uh, so to help uh, think about the importance of doing this and, and maybe giving us pointers, advice on how we should do this, I've invited my friend uh, Mike Lacona. He's the president of uh, Risen Jesus, which is uh, Mike's uh, teaching and speaking ministry. He's a part of the Defenders Alliance, and he's a professor at Houston Baptist University. Mike, thanks so much for joining us on the program today. 
Hey, my pleasure, Kurt. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, great to see you. Um, yeah, you too, brother. It, it's actually been a while, uh, surprisingly. Probably, I feel like you know we're in contact with each other uh, on a regular basis, but you were on our program here probably in the first few episodes there just about two years ago. Um, oh, what did we speak on? <laughs> I, I think it was on Gospel Differences. It was before okay. your book was published. Um, and then I think it came out that following winter, if I remember correctly. Okay. Yeah, November of 2016. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, right the week before Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, and I know we've been meaning I still need to contact um, – you, there's a, a scholar at Oxford, Christopher Pelling. We've talked about maybe doing an episode just on that and having him review your book and what his thoughts were. He's the foremost scholar on Plutarch, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. He's, yeah, everybody seems to. Uh, Richard Burge says that. Um, and uh, I have a friend up there in Chicagoland, uh, John Ramsey. He's a professor emeritus uh, of Greek and classics at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Okay. And uh, he says, yeah, Pelling is the guy. He is the guy when it comes to uh, Plutarch. So that might be fun to have you guys come on and have you uh, maybe get spanked by a Plutarch scholar. No, I mean. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, Pelling and Ramsey, they know more, far more about Pel uh, the Plut Plutarch than I will ever know. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, yeah, we'll have to set that up some other time. But on today's program, um, I thought of you uh, given your experience in this area. Um, because not only do you just engage with non-believers uh, from conversations and messages, but you've participated in the, the public debates. Uh, you've gotten up on the stage many times in your life, and um, from debating atheists, agnostics, skeptics, Muslims. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any been any other category of persons you've debated. Um, you might say liberal. What's that? You might say liberal. Just liberal, uh, yeah, a broad yeah, ca category. Elaine yeah. Maples, you know, someone like that. Yeah, so you've, you've debated a range of perspectives, uh, a range of individuals and their perspectives. And so, um, you know, I've got some questions for you in your experience and uh, advice that you uh, may have for um, believers. So to get us started off, tell me first, what got you interested in uh, debating others? Ah, well, uh, that would go back to the late 1990s, I suppose, and um, I can remember, I don't know how I found out about it, but someone had told me about um, Bill Craig's debates, with his debate with Frank Zindler and John Dominic Crossan. So that year, I don't know what year it was, but uh, it was the late 1990s, uh, so probably 20 years ago, um, I asked for those for Christmas. <laughs> and so I got them on audio cassette tapes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Craig's debate with John Dominic Crossan uh, came in a two pack, and his debate with uh, Frank Zindler came in a two pack. And I can't tell you how many times I listened to both those debates. I mean, huh. just tons of times uh, driving in the car and trips and things like that. I would listen to them constantly, and I just. I learned so much mm. through those, um, and I was reading through his book, Reasonable Faith. I can't even tell you how many times I read through Actually, at that point, not only was it in writing, but it was also in audio cassette tapes, and I listened to it multiple times in audio cassette tapes, and then later bought the book to listen to. And then there were some other apologetics books I read, but I was just so fascinated, and I thought, wow, Dr. Craig just did such a phenomenal job in both those debates, and I thought, ah, oh, that sounds like so much fun. I'll never be able to do that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> he's got two earned doctorates, and I haven't even got my master's degree yet. You know, I haven't even finished a master's degree, and I thought, yeah, I mean, he's just brilliant. Anyway, yeah, everybody knows Bill Craig's in a league all by himself, you know, but it, that's how I got interested in it. And then... Um, Right after I got started in my Ph.D. program, early spring of 2003, um, Gary Habermas was contacted and asked to debate Dan Barker of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and was asked to debate him at the University of Wisconsin in Madison on the resurrection. And at that point, Gary did not like debating. He, he just didn't want to take part in him. Mm. And so he called me and he said, hey, Mike, I've been asked to uh, debate Dan Barker. I don't want to do it. He says, you know how I hate debates. And um, uh, but you've mentioned how you're kind of interested. Is this something you'd like to do? Because I could refer you to it. 
And I said, uh, yeah, but do you think I can win? And he said, well, you know, Dan's going to be tough. He's got a lot of debate experience. He's got a genius IQ, um, but you know more about the resurrection than he does. And so I think he'd be a really good opponent. I think you could win, be a really great opponent. So I did that. I think it was in April 2003, and uh, it went really well. Even the uh, atheist organization who had invited Barker said that I won the debate. Huh. And um, so I, I really enjoyed it uh, before I'd even heard that. And so uh, the next year, Gary got two more debate offers, one for Shabir Ali and one for Richard Carrier. And he says, Mike, these, you know, I don't want to do them. Do you want to do them? They're going to be a whole lot tougher than uh, – than, uh, than Barker, and uh, Shabir is the leading Muslim debater in the world with a ton of experience. Uh, so I said, yeah, well, I don't know. Do you think I can win? He says, oh, I, I think you could, you could do a good job. I think you'd probably win, but it's going to take a whole lot of work. And I was especially concerned with, um, with Shabir Ali. Mm. Uh, so, um, man, I worked hard. I worked really hard. <laughs> we, we prayed. Uh, my board and I, you know, we ran it by my board at that point, and um, we agreed that I, I, I should do it. So I did, and I enjoyed both those debates, but that's how I got started in it. That's what yeah. led me. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're getting started at that level, I mean, you're just, you, you've got the gold plate for you there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. It sounds like you've had a wonderful opportunity to um, just really um, go full throttle um, with that aspect of, of your, your, your research and your ministry. Uh, I know it's been beneficial for me as well. Um, back when I was in college, I would listen to some of these debates that you've done. Um, so it's, it's been a blessing to me. Um, so, all right. Um, <clears throat> getting here more to the, the, the debate aspects. Um, and and I we're going to talk a little later about you know not everyone's going to debate but I want to pick your brain right now what what sort of research do you do um, ahead of time for debates like that? Hmm. Well, um, the first thing I, I yeah you know, I might approach it a little bit differently today than I did back then. Um, I had a whole lot more to do back then than I do today because when I was first getting started, I had you know I. I I didn't know as much about the resurrection and, and, and everything related to it as I do now. So, um, you know, getting started with that in spring, uh, 15 years ago, it was, uh, I had to develop my own case for the resurrection of Jesus, for one. And then I had to know what they were going to say in, yeah. in response. And so what that meant was to look at every video uh, online um, they had uh, the internet back in the 90s? <laughs> no, this is early 2000s. So, oh, okay, uh, I got gotcha. you. You know, so you upgraded from cassette tapes. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but now we've crossed the millennium. We're in 2004, you yeah. know, for these follow-up debates. So, uh, you know, I'd go online and I'd, I'd try to find any videos. And, of course, not all videos were online at that point. Right. So, you know, I'd purchase videos, if I could, DVDs. Of debates that they had done on that topic or anything related to it. I would listen to MP3s or cassette tapes or anything of things, lectures or debates that my opponent had done on that subject. Mm. I'd purchase books or journal articles or anything that my opponent had written on that topic uh, or read, you know, an online article. So I spent a whole lot of time seeing how my opponent argued on that particular, um, you know, topic. Yeah. I'd summarize their arguments, uh, make note, you know, I might say, you know, if there was something that they had said that I thought might be valuable to use in a debate, I would write down what they said verbatim, you know, quote and, and be able to cite page number and all that. Mm. Um, and um, so I'd understand where they were coming from as best as I could. I'd have all these arguments um, and then I would formulate my own responses to what my opponent would say. And it really caused me to think through some things. Mm. Um, you know, because it's not like you're just going in and talking to your Sunday school class or, or preaching a sermon from the pulpit, uh, you know, preaching to the choir, you might say. Yeah. Um, you, you knew going into that debate that there were going to be hundreds of people watching live. Um, and, um, you know, if it got put online or you, at that point, you sold them in DVDs. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, thousands of people could end up watching it. Uh, I had no idea it would explode like it has now. I mean, the debate I had with Bart Ehrman just a few months ago now has, it just uh, today crossed 70,000 views on YouTube. Mm, nice. Uh, the debate that I did with Matt Dillahunty last year now has over 115,000 views. So I, I would have never guessed anything like that. But because you know that there's going to be so many people uh, viewing these, um, you know, you don't want to be embarrassed. You want to, <laughs> um, and, and so things that you might give, you, you really, the typical arguments that you might give, you're going to reassess those and you're going to say, well, how might my, res- my opponent respond to this and what would I say? Yeah. And you really have to, to assess your own answers and say, well, is this evidence that I'm giving good enough? Mm. Um, can it withstand the toughest critical scrutiny? Can my rebuttals really withstand uh, critical scrutiny because I want to put out good stuff. Yeah. So that takes a lot of reflection, a lot of deep thinking. And um, so that's the kind of stuff that you do to prepare for a debate. Hmm. Plus put together your own opening statement. And a lot of times you put together the opening statement in such a way that you are trying to answer so- certain objections before the, my opponent even gives them. Yeah. And uh, that's at the very least a, a testament to um, to being prepared uh, to to always give you know an answer. First uh, Peter three fifteen here that you had to really prepare yourself for those public debates, and not that everyone's going to stand up on the debate stage, but a lot of people are having conversations with their neighbor, their friend, their family member, right, their loved one, and they need to be prepared. They need to know how to ex- explain what it is that they believe, why they de- believe it. And then, as you did with your research, Mike, you anticipated objections from your opponents. You researched what they said, what they wrote, and you were ready for them. And you were ready for what they were going to say. And that's part of being a good debater, I suppose. <laughs> that's uh, a lot of, it's a lot of work. It, it really is. It, um I don't remember how much work I put in for the debate with Dan Barker, but I do remember the debates with uh, the first one with Shabir Ali and Richard Carrier. Gary Habermas had taught me a thing that he did, and I was applying it at the time because, you know, we had ministry donors, and I felt very accountable to them Mm. uh, that I'm really working for, you know, what they're investing in with our ministry. So I had a, you yeah. know, one of those watches with a stopwatch on. And anytime I was working, I'd have the stopwatch going. If my wife came in the room to say hi or bring me a brownie or something, I would turn the stopwatch off. She hated that, but I would, that's what <laughs> I would do. Any breaks that I took that I wasn't actually doing research or work of any kind, I turned it off. Yeah. Now with that in mind, and you wouldn't, you'd be surprised at how much time a person wastes or, or I shouldn't say waste, but they're not actually working yeah, during the day. Right, interruptions, yep. In my two debates, the one with Richard Carrier and um, and Shabir Ali, the first one, I prepared more than 70 hours a week using that method for four months. Wow. So um, it's a lot of preparation. 70 hours a week? Yeah, and now it's not uh, for four months for each. That was combined for, for both of them. You know, because they were like one month or six weeks apart. Oh, gotcha. So, yeah, sev- more than 70 hours a week Yeah. Uh, with four months' work with those. Okay, wow. Yeah, you really have to be devoted to preparing for those public debates. Wow. And I don't put in nearly that much time now. Right, because you've, ar- you've already got down some of the arguments. Yeah, right. Um, all right, so not everyone is called to debate, but it seems like Paul's uh, uh, writings in a couple places – really entail that every Christian engage in uh, with non-believers in some way. Uh, what advice would you have to people that don't want to go on the debate stage? Don't. <laughs> I mean, the, the truth, I mean, that's a, it's that simple. Um, don't go on the debate stage, the debate stage if, if, if that's not where you think you want to do or you're gifting. Um, it doesn't mean you're any less uh, of a person. Look, most Christian apologists do not debate. Yeah, There's few of us who actually get up there and debate. And I, I think it just takes, it, it's just the way one is wired. Um, you know, some people can't do it. With, uh, talk to someone and with someone who di- with whom they disagree um, without getting really upset. Some people have said to me, well, how can you 
be up there and debate without getting really mad at what the person <laughs> had said. And I, I don't know. I mean, you just don't. Um, it just doesn't impact uh, us, uh, you know, in those kinds of ways. So yeah. some of us have a personality. Look, um, you know, my wife, she would never want to get up and, and debate or do public speaking. But, man, my wife is really into the nitty gritty of accounting and all that kind of stuff, the kind of stuff that would make me want to vomit, you know, <laughs> because it's just not the way I'm wired. But she yeah. loves that stuff. That is her strength. And she does really well at that. It's not my strength, but, uh, you know, I feel like I, uh, one of my giftings is to be able to do some public speaking and to do mm. uh, debates. It's the way I'm wired. So it doesn't mean you're any less, you know, gifted or anything you, you're just gifted in other areas and i'd say find the areas in which you are strong and pursue those areas and and you know we need to to be able to interact with people um with non-believers when they ask us questions some are going to be more inclined to do it than others but we should have some basic knowledge be able to be to respond in w with basic answers at least yep. to these things so um yeah yeah don't debate if you don't feel like that's your gifting, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, right, right. Um, okay, I've listened to a number of your debates, and I can tell that you um, you present arguments that you um, believe have have really good merit to them. Uh, you don't try to overstate your case. Uh, you're you're very modest, uh, intellectually humble in your approach. Uh, so what goes through your mind here in terms of what arguments to present? Um, because I'm sure there are some arguments you think are good and, and believe personally, but you're not, say, willing to put them out there um, on the debate stage. So how do you decide which ones you want to defend on a, in a debate? Hmm. And and is my observation accurate, by the way? That Oh, that your observation is definitely accurate. I'm not saying humble, you know. <laughs> but... Um, um, I wouldn't be humble to say that your assessment that I'm humble is correct. <laughs> but um, no, I, I only want to present arguments that I truly believe in. Yeah. If I don't believe in that argument, I don't want to give it. All right. Because I, honestly, I, I'm after truth. And um, if, if it's not true, I don't want to say it just to gain points. If I think I can get debate points out of it, I, I really want to believe what I say because. At the end of the day, um, you know, I've got to stand before God when I die, if God exists, which I believe he does, and I have to stand before him and give account of myself. And so I want to be honest with myself so that if for some reason I've been wrong and Christianity is not true, at least God will know that I really sought truth. Um, so I, I want within that vein, I, I want to present argu only those arguments that I believe. That's just my own personal preference. There, that's what I want to do. Sure. Now, I don't say I, I try not to say things that go beyond what the evidence can bear, because when you do that, you expose yourself. Mm. And so, some would you know want to argue for a lot of different things. They want to argue. Um, you know, that God exists, that Christianity is true, that the Bible is reliable, historically reliable, that it's inerrant. Well, why would I argue? I might believe that the Bible is inerrant, but why would I go that far? You know, the evidence for biblical inerrancy isn't even close to what it is for historical reliability, which yeah. isn't even close to what we have for, say, the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to present the strongest argument I can. And the more that I try to prove and narrow things down, the weaker the case becomes for that. And if someone can punch a hole or cause great doubt in, in one of those weaker points, then in the mind of some of those viewing the debate, it will cast the rest of the debate in question. I would rather present as strong a case as I can. And that usually means just putting forth the strongest of data. Mm. And a lot of times that means that I will only present those, like if I'm talking about the resurrection, I'll only present those facts uh, which uh, are so strongly evidenced that it has compelled 
the overwhelming majority of even skeptical scholars to grant them. Mm. That's what Gary Habermas calls the minimal facts approach. Sometimes I will go beyond that and I'll add something like, well, um, they were proclaiming Jesus's bodily, physical resurrection from the dead. And um, I'll, I'll go beyond that because I, I feel that the uh, after viewing it, the evidence for that fact is unimpeachable. I think it's that strong. And so I want to put it out there to challenge people to answer that. So sometimes I'll add that. A lot of times I'll, I'll start to add that. I can add the empty tomb, but I haven't. Um, so it's just, you know, where I want to go with it at a time. And sometimes I'll just change things up just to get something that's a little fresher than what I've been doing, you know? Yeah, nice. Um, here's a question. So um, for a lot of folks who aren't debating... And they might be, um, you know, new to apologetics and they love it and uh, they're learning a lot and they really want to almost embarrass their opponent, really corner them. Um, should that be our goal when we are engaging with non-believers to, to corner and make someone look bad? I don't want to make my opponent look bad up there. I, I don't. Um, I it. I guess there's degree degrees at which you can do that. So, you know, if my like there have been times with Bart Ehrman where he might say, well, you know, the Gospels contradict themselves. Therefore, you can't trust them. And I might point out where he's contradicted himself in his own writings. You know, Um, it's true. Plus, it has some good rhetorical effect. Um, But so I I guess that can just I don't know. There's just different occasions. I, I don't believe I've ever tried to humiliate my opponent. I don't want to do that. I really care for my opponents. I, I want to be friends with them. I am friends with, with most of my opponents. So, I mean, Bart Ehrman, I consider him to be a friend. I truly like the guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, he and I get along really well. So I don't feel like, you know, putting him down. In fact, I don't think things that to put him down. I, I just like him. So yeah. I would rather be up there and, I mean, of course, if a zinger comes up, you, you could do it. <laughs> but you and even it, do that with friends, right? I mean, you, you, <laughs> you do it with friends and you can do it and you can smile and it's all done in, 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 in a good taste, good humor. And they realize that you're not trying to, to put them down, mm. you know? So, yeah. So that's where I'm at with it. Nice. Let me ask you one question from a listener uh, before we go to our break. Uh, Justin writes in here and he's wondering, um, he asks, why don't you try to tie the historical argument for the resurrection uh, with prophecy? For example, Isaiah 52 and 53. Fair question. Well, uh, for one, I haven't been uh, an avid student of prophecy, so I, I don't know enough about it to be able to do that. Um, it could be someplace where I could go in the future. Um, another reason is the, a lot of the prophecies, and this wouldn't be to all of them, but a lot of the prophecies that you, that you you do see people citing like, hey, there's over 600 prophecies of Jesus or whatever. Okay, and then you start looking at them and saying, well, and, you know, I'm not too impressed by that one. Now, some of them are kind of impressive, you know, but then... I'm not persuaded by a number of them. I, you know, like, for example, what, what do they do for the resurrection? Well, when you read Paul in the book of Acts and Peter, they will bring up verses such as Psalm 2-7, which says, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or Psalm 16-10, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. Well, you know, and, and Paul, Peter, they apply these to Jesus's resurrection. But when you look at them in their original context, they are clearly referring to King David. Whereas Psalm 2-7, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Um, it's it's a, a, a psalm of coronation hmm. of the king. Mm-hmm. So, but Paul takes it in Acts chapter 13 and reassigns that to be talking about the resurrection and saying, hey, we it can't be referring to David because uh, you know, David died, was buried, and his body decayed. We know where his grave is. But Jesus died, buried. Um, his body did not decay, but God raised it. And of that were eyewitnesses. So he takes it and gives it a whole new meaning to Psalm 1610 than what was originally intended. So is that a prophecy? 
Well, that kind of charismatic exegesis is something they did back then, but it's not something that is impressive to many of us today, Mm. and certainly would not be impressive to a skeptic. And yet these are the prophecies that are used to refer to Jesus' resurrection. So, So, you know, Maybe that can help some. Yeah, so so maybe, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like when um, you've got a debate opponent, you you want to grant certain standards that even your opponent has, and you argue for the resurrection based upon that standard. So whether it's Paul debating the Jews, um, right, in Acts 18, he goes in the synagogue, well, a number of places he goes in the synagogues, and he debates the Jews, so he uses the scriptures um, but say if right. you're debating Bart Ehrman, who doesn't grant that there's value here in the Old Testament, you you don't want to use prophecy because it's not going to win him or his followers over. So you want to use his standard and and assess the resurrection on that standard. Is that fair? That is that is fair. Um, so I suppose if I were going to debate a rabbi, yeah, or a, a, maybe you a, would use the Jewish a, scriptures. Then I I would use I would I would look more into the the matter of prophecy, but then I would also have to deal with the fact that you know the scriptures that they're using to pre to to talk about Jesus' resurrection in the Book of Acts yeah um, did not originally refer to that you know you had this different sort of interpretation, and I would have to look and show how this is what Jews did back then, not just Christians but Jews yeah um, otherwise I, I I couldn't use it they, yeah they gave versus secondary meanings, perhaps, or maybe that was their primary meaning. I guess that's what the debate is with yeah. scholars and those interested. Yeah. Hey, we've got to take a break here. Um, uh, Justin, by the way, thanks for your good question and thanks for watching today. We've got another number of folks tuning in here. Um, Joe uh, writes in here. He's, he's wondering if uh, we put the shows on YouTube. Uh, let me say this. Um, it is something that we're looking to do this year. Uh, and... I would do it myself were I not so busy. So we would love to get your support so we can uh, pay maybe our technical producer, (coughs) Chris, uh, to come in even like one day a week. And so he could just work on the YouTube videos and and manage that that account for us. It's part of me. I like to do things the right way. So I don't want to just haphazardly, um, you know, go into something. So if we could say raise support to to have uh, someone be managing that, uh, all fine and dandy. Awesome. Let's do it. So that's part of our goal here with Brass City Hill in 2018, and we'd love to get your support. All right. After the break here, um, uh, we're going to talk more about the importance of engaging with non-believers. what sort of benefits there are for ourselves and, and for the people we are actually talking to. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Dr. Mike Lacona. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google, empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, Nonprofit Megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If uh, you would like to learn how you or your your organization, uh, your company would like to become a sponsor, you can go to our website, veracityhill.com and click on that patron tab. And we've got different sponsorship levels. 
uh, if you want to get your your company's logo up there and a link to your website. And also, one of the things that we do is we um, mention our sponsors at the end of every program. Very grateful for them. Uh, so if you're interested and if you want to learn how to do that, just contact me, Kurt at VeracityHill.com. Today we are joined um, by Dr. Mike Lacona. He's a professor at Houston Baptist University and the president of Risen Jesus. Um, Mike, I can't remember. I don't think we had rapid questions when you came on the program. Do you ever remember doing rapid questions? I don't. Let's go for it if you want. All right. So we've got 60 seconds here. You won't be able to hear the game clock, but it'll start as soon as I ask the first question. And the goal is to answer as many questions as fast as you can. So there are 23. Our best record, I think, was 21 uh, by actually my pastor, Nate Hickox. Um, wow. he, he was, um, I, you know what, I think he, I think he's listened to the program before, and so he kind of prepared, I think. He, was, he knew what was coming. All right. Okay, so I'll start the time, and here we go. You ready? What is your clothing store of choice? Uh, um, untuck it. Taco Bell or KFC? KFC. What school did you go to? Uh, University of Pretoria. What song is playing on the radio, your radio these days? Chris Rice, um, The Power of a Moment. Where would you like to live? Um, with my wife. Favorite sport? Baseball. What fruit would you say your head is shaped like? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. An, an, an orange. <laughs> What's your most hated sports franchise? Uh, the New England Patriots. Good answer. Do you drink Dr. Pepper? Sure. Uh, who's one person you'd like to have dinner with to discuss a topic you disagree on? Um, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Pick a fictional character that you'd like to meet. Oh, man. Um, a rational atheist. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, where's where's the rim shot? Yeah, I need to get that on. Wow, nice. All right. <laughs> All right, well, Mike, thank you for playing that round of rapid questions. Um, boy, there are a, a number I, I want to ask you. We'll have to for the next time when we have you on with Pelling. I've got to arrange and, that. And, and you know, there are a lot of rational atheists that yes. just came to my mind to be funny. It a was just a zinger. How about rational militant atheist? Hell's okay. Out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Um, Michaela's uh, listening in here. She says your head is not shaped like an orange. <laughs> So we'll have to ha maybe have the listeners assess that. Mike, can you turn your head a little bit? Maybe just profile. <laughs> no, it's just a funny question. All right, let's get back here. Um, oh, before you, um, baseball, you've got a, a, an Atlanta Braves jersey on. And uh, who's your favorite Atlanta Brave uh, these days? Oh, yeah. to be honest with you, I haven't been following them closely enough to, to know even – I mean, I know a few of the players, yeah. Freddie Freeman, you know, but because um, he's been with the the franchise for a while. But right, team is so different now than it was when I was really watching them a few years ago. So I, I really don't have a favorite player. Okay, and um, now you grew up in Baltimore. So did I you did. you grow up an Orioles fan? Oh man, Baltimore Orioles, the old the old Orioles teams. Uh, yeah, they were awesome. I'd say Brooks Robinson was my favorite Oriole from back then. But okay. I mean, there were so many good ones that I Boop Powell and Jim Palmer and Dave McNally, Paul Blair, Mark Belanger, all those. I mean, they were just great. So yeah, uh, nice. Awesome. It'd be hard to pick a favorite one there. And so your hatred of the New England Patriots, did that start as a Baltimore Ravens fan or as an Atlanta? Um, Probably as a, a Ravens fan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, Hey, you know, you got to give the the Patriots uh, credit for the way they came back and won the Super Bowl against the Falcons a few uh, years ago. It's a phenomenal yeah. game. I mean, they they shouldn't have won, but the Falcons blew it, and the the Pats deserve to win. You you can't take that away from them. They're yeah. just a phenomenal team. They're just so good. You get sick about hearing about them. You know. I remember watching that game, and it breaks my heart because I too disliked the Patriots. And it was the third quarter, and everyone was like, "This is a blowout. Game's over." And I am an experienced, I'm not diehard, but I'm an experienced football fan. And I said, Tom Brady is on the Patriots. 
guys, you need to sit down. <laughs> the game's not over. <laughs> so it's, it's not over till the, the clock runs out. The biggest thing I remember about that game had nothing to do with the game. Mm. Because it was at halftime that I got an email from Scott McKnight, and he gave me a link to the review of my book on gospel differences that would be posted in a few days. Yeah. And what he said in the final paragraph just made me jump out of my seat and say, yes. So I didn't care at that point what happened <laughs> with the uh, with the Falcons. It's like, nice. man, it was just an awesome endorsement. Yep, yep. We've got uh, Jonathan writing in here. He he asks, engaging with non-believers, yet the topic is demolishing arguments. Jonathan, yes, you're just joining us. I can see um, what we are talking about today is um, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, the Apostle Paul writes uh, that uh, we demolish arguments. Um, and uh, here it is. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So what does that mean here? At, at least in how it, it's applying to our context today, um, we are um, encouraged here uh, by Paul to engage with those that aren't believers and to, to take those arguments and thoughts captive for Christ. And so... Um, for a, a number of Christians, they're just comfortable living in their isolated circles. And that's not what uh, the scriptures teach us to do. We are called to engage with those that think differently than us. And um, so as y you and I, Jonathan, have even engaged from time to time, and you came on our program, I think may have been a year and a half ago. Uh, so here here it is that um, I'm applying this, uh, this verse here in our context today. Uh, so we're talking about the importance therein of engaging with non-believers. And so in the first half of the program, Mike, we talked about sort of debating and what got you interested. Um, but I want to ask you a, a broader question here. Why should Christians Christians engage with non-believers on worldview issues? Well, wasn't it C.S. Lewis? I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, it was C.S. Lewis or someone around that time who said... Um, you know, bad philosophy, uh, we must answer. Good philosophy exists if only to answer bad philosophy. There you go. Yeah. And so if we do not respond to these kinds of arguments, um, it gives the impression to non-believers that we don't have answers for these things. And and we do. We have good answers. You know, I was reading an article that uh, a, a link was provided on Twitter, and I was reading it yesterday, and it was a debate between – um, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. And, and Sam Harris would say things like, you know, it's so stupid to, it, to believe in Christianity and God. I mean, it's just like believing in Catwoman mm. and astrology. You know, why would any sane person believe that? And, you know, one of the, a militant atheist like him, they, they typically will speak in those kinds of, of tone. And I, I thought, you know what? I would probably have the same view. Hmm. And think that it was insane if I were willing to ignore all the data that we get from uh, molecular biology and astrophysics that point to an intelligent designer of the universe and life itself. Ev evidence data that even people like Richard Dawkins and Francis Crick were willing to admit that it, point, it seems to have strong suggestions for a designer. Um, wasn't, it, and, wasn't it Crick who posited aliens planted yeah. DNA? I mean, that was his position. Directed panspermia wow. by Francis Crick, and also you could see in that movie Expelled that Richard Dawkins promotes yeah. the same kind of thing. Right. So, you know, it, if you're willing to go to that extent and ignore the evidence that points to a, a designer of the universe in life, um, if I'm willing to stick my head in the sand when it comes to things such as the problem of consciousness, which even prominent atheist philosophers, many of them have acknowledged that this is an insoluble uh, problem hmm. for atheism to hmm. explain how human consciousness came through naturalistic processes. If you're willing to um, stick your head in the sand for certain philosophical arguments like a teleological, a cosmological argument, like the Kalam cosmological argument, if you're willing to ignore the evidence, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, well, then I would come to the same conclusion that re Christianity is a ridiculous view. The difference between Sam Harris and me is I'm not willing to stick my hand in, head in the sand when it comes <laughs> to the evidence. Yeah. Wow. Um, 
But it's important for us to do this because if we don't do it, but uh, here, I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, back in, I think it was 2010, 2009, 2009, I debated Richard Carrier the second time out at uh, uh, Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. After the debate, this girl, a student, came up to me. She told me she was a junior, and she said, I'm really glad I came to the debate. Um, when I got here as a freshman, I saw how I saw the animosity of professors and students toward Christianity, and it led me to give up my Christian faith. Mm. And I heard about this debate, and I just was curious. I wanted to come in and see it. I really thought you'd, you, you would get demolished, you know. <laughs> but she said... I couldn't. I can't believe the strong evidence there is for the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm, she said, "I'm coming back to the faith. Wow! And I'm going to get involved in a in a group, a strong, you know, a Bible group here on campus." And you know, it's like, wow, that's what a debate did. Mm. So that's the kind of thing, you know, that's really important for for people seeking truth. It gives them truth. But if we don't present the truth, um, how are they going to know what's true? Yeah. And People are just going to walk away from the faith because we're not answering the objections that come up. So, um, what happened here was you went and did this debate. And while in your debates, you would love for your opponent to come over to your side. There, there's an audience. There's an audience that's listening. Um, on the internet, part of the reason why I engage is because there are lurkers. There are people reading the comments. That's and, right. And uh, and and it you know gives them hope, you might say. Or for some that are really seeking, they might be impressed. I, I can remember, you know, ten ten years ago, you know, at, at least in the circles I was in, it was very popular to think, hey, Christ, Christians are irrational, or Christianity is irrational. And having you know spent time studying and engaging. I don't know really how anyone could make that claim uh, when you really begin to study it, even if Christianity is wrong uh, in the end. Uh, I don't think you can say that it's irrational. Uh, there are very good reasons for why people are Christians, and these are reasons that people really should give weight to and consider in their own lives. Um, so here for this gal that uh, chatted with you, you know, she came up to you and, 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 t and said that. Um, but there are others who might not even come up to you and thank you. There are others that might just think up through these things uh, on their own. And so step by step, you know, we can begin to push people. Oh, it's, the, it's called the angle scale, I think, um, where people are at a certain uh, degree and you want to walk them, you know, one step closer um, toward your position. Uh, so there's, there's value in doing that. And there's uh, value for just having everyday conversations with atheists, uh, with agnostics, with Muslims and Hindus. Christians should not be fearful. Uh, um, Christians, in fact, should be welcoming of such dialogue. Um, and if you are fearful, I think maybe it's an indicator that you're not prepared, that you're insecure in your own beliefs. Um, and I think that should be an admonishment to get with the program here, especially in the United States where the culture is just quickly shifting. Um, so it's st something we need to do. Uh, now, a lot of people, um, especially more on the liberal side of the spectrum, they've done what are called these interfaith dialogues. And I've been to a couple of those in my day, and I'm just not impressed. Um, interfaith dialogues are more of, oh, here's what I believe isn't that nice, and here's what you believe in isn't that nice. So I don't know if I've seen this term anywhere else. I've come up with a term. Let me know if I've coined it. I'll trademark it. Cross worldview engagement. That seems much better than interfaith dialogue. Cross worldview engagement. Uh, so Mike, tell me, um, in your earlier years, when you began studying these topics, what role did cross worldview engagement play in your journey of uh, to faith? In my journey to faith, I probably didn't play any role in it. Well, but didn't you evaluate the arguments? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I, I was thinking about when I became a Christian at the age of 10. Oh, oh. Uh, but or I maybe say, when you began uh, doubting, let's see. Yeah, okay. So, when I began doubting and I was prepared to give up my faith if I, I felt the, uh, if I believed the evidence pointed away from Christianity and to some other worldview, um, yeah, I, I ended up 
I didn't do many dialogues with non-believers. I, I did a few at that point, but I mean, I looked at, at things. Um, I looked at Hinduism, I looked at Buddhism, I looked at Islam, and I looked at atheism. So I didn't consider all the different worldviews, but sure. I, I did look at those. And I wasn't so much concerned with what they believed. I was more concerned with what's the historical evidence to show that these are true. Mm. So for example, when it came to Hinduism, uh, you know, look at the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, that's about a battle that allegedly took place about 3000 BC and where Krishna becomes incarnated. And so I asked a leading Hindu scholar, I said, um, um, so what's the evidence we have that Krishna actually appeared here on Earth? And he said, well, the very first mention of Krishna in the historical record, it can be traced back to either 400 or 500 BC, where... Uh, in which it's mentioned on an inscription somewhere that Krishna was worshipped. So that's 25 to 2600 years after he allegedly came down here. Mm. And even today, I was told that legend uh, continues to develop within Hinduism, and they don't have any problem with it. So, you know, it's like you just can't even trust the background of, of things like that. And I looked at Buddhism, I looked at I Islam more than the others, and I, I think Islam is one of the most easily refuted religions in the world when I look at the evidence, um, so or the lack of it, and the evidence that they typically present, which is nothing like what the Quran pre presents. Mm. The one test that the Quran presents is um, try to create a surah, a chapter just like one in the Quran, and you'll see that you can't. Of course, in another surah it says, but if you do even try, you'll be damned forever. So... Um, <laughs> But I think if you try to do it, you can sit down and look, and you'll see that it's quite easy to, to mm. do one just like that. Um, so, I mean, the, the Christianity has so much more going for it than any of the other worldviews uh, when you look at the historical evidence for it. Yeah. Um, okay, so while we've been talking a lot about debates and how you've prepared and the value therein, you know, that there's an audience or there are lurkers. Uh, so it's not necessarily about your debate opponent, but not everyone, uh, has, uh, a desire to get up on that debate stage. Nevertheless, uh, they're still encouraged to engage with people who uh, are not Christians and engage, do the cross worldview engagement. Um, what advice would you have for them, uh, in terms of how they, um, learn more about different worldviews and things that they should consider in their conversations with their, you know, their neighbor. So we're talking about people who are not interested in getting up on the stage and doing debate, right? right? Yes. Okay. So, I, you know, there's going to be people of, of different interest levels. And, you know, we all have different interest levels. And, you, you know, some, some people, what? All right, people like you and me, we really are interested in evidence. That's kind of our, our thing. Yeah. Some people aren't so much interested in that. So I would say at least become familiarized with apologetics. They can do that, I think, very simply by picking up Lee Strobel's books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for a Creator, The Case for the Real Jesus. These are pretty easy reads. They're good reads. They give a lot of good information in it, and they can get a solid foundation that's going to be able to address a whole lot of folks, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, questions, and, and, and equip them with some things. And that may be all they need. Or, you know, maybe Bill Craig's book, On Guard, you yeah. know, that will provide. It doesn't get into a whole lot of uh, detail, but that one book will give sufficient evidence uh, and, and train. It's going to be a little heavier, that I'd say, than, than Strobel's books. Yeah. But it's still very, very good. Now, if someone's interested in apologetics, or they don't, you know, apologetics is more or less defending the faith. And we do things more like I consider myself a Christian apologist, but I don't know. I'm kind of in the middle of, of some things. When, when I'm doing my research, I'm not doing it for apologetics. Mm. I'm doing it because I want to know truth. Yeah. And if it can apply to apologetics, fantastic. If it can't, that's okay with me. Um, so I, I'm kind of caught between, I want to be New Testament, you know, really seek truth and know about Jesus and all this. And then I also want to defend the faith. Um, but if, if a person just really wants to know this for themselves enough to satisfy their own doubts and because they're seeking, well, you know, they can get into some deeper stuff like On Guard by William Lane Craig or the book, his 
deeper book, Reasonable Faith, or go back and watch episodes of Veracity Hill. <laughs> or read The Case of the Resurrection by Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas. Yep, that's that's <laughs> one right there. Or if they really want to get involved, that you know, if, if pick a subject in which they're really interested. If they if they really want to go deep with it, you know, yep. there are various things like well, in gospel differences. I, I think my book, the recent one, why are there differences in the gospels? Is something they should read on 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 that. Or um, uh, you know, on the resurrection, the one that Gary and I did, or my real thick book on it. Um, yeah. If they're interested in science creation, you know, there's books, you know, molecular biology or astrophysics or that all together that they can look at. So there's a lot of different things that they can do. They can watch debates online. I mean, this is that's they can learn a lot. I, sure. I cut my teeth on apologetics by uh, watching de- William Lane Craig debates, you know, so um, they, they can do that and learn a lot. And that's a really good way to do it because. You get both sides, and you get to see all the objections, and you get to see it done in a very concise manner. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of cool. Yeah, so people do have varying levels of interest, but for those that even just have, you know, barely any, it seems like they should at least familiarize themselves with names of people who are. So, you know, to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm not sure I have an answer for you right now, but wh- why don't you check out Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, where he interviews different scholars. So that, that, I think, can be so much uh, more helpful for winning people over into the faith than just say, oh, well, the Bible just says so. You know, it doesn't seem – a statement like that does not work uh, with people who have already rejected it as a, as a, a fantasy or a fairy tale. Um, so – Good, Mike. Well, thank you so much for joining on uh, joining us on today's program. It's been great to pick your brain about uh, your experience in debates um, and the thoughts and advice you have to uh, budding apologists or to those that maybe should just get more interested in it. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time here on your Saturday afternoon. Oh, thanks for having me. This has been fun. Good. Thanks. And we'll be in touch again. I, w- I, w- I do want to uh, schedule a time for you and Christopher Pelling to come on at the same time. That'd be awesome. That would be uh, interesting. So awesome. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks, Mike. We'll be in touch. God bless yeah, you. God bless you all. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right. So uh, that does it for today's program. On uh, next week's program, uh, David Montoya will be filling in, uh, and the topic of the program will be the teleological argument. He will be interviewing Alan Hainline. And uh, so um, I'm not sure if I'll be back. I'll, I'm going to be away for a week, actually, at Lake Geneva Youth Camp, where I uh, try to go up once a year to their annual teen camp week, and I counsel and talk to the teens. It's a great opportunity for them to ask someone who studies theology their deep questions. Uh, So it's real fun for me. It's fun for them. Uh, Although, of course, they don't go just for me. But uh, it's it's fun nonetheless. And um, God bless my wife. She's willing to let me take a week away from home to do that. Uh, So I'm not sure if I'll be back in time. Uh, So I might be back. We'll see if I am. I'll be sitting on the other side of the the table here and maybe just making comments from the peanut gallery. Um, So that'll be next week's episode. And uh, we've got a number of other episodes lined up for you. Uh, And so looking forward to uh, what is to come here on Veracity Hill. Again, um, check out the Marco Polo app. Seems really fun. Video walkie talkie, totally free. We're going to be starting a Veracity Hill Marco Polo group. So if you want to become one of our monthly supporters, five, ten dollars a month, um, you can join that group and we'll have a lot of fun there talking about these theological issues. Uh, So, all right, that does it for the program today. I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons and the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. And I want to thank our technical producer, Chris. Uh, We had a number of stuff we were figuring out beforehand, so I'm glad you know what you're doing, Chris. And I also want to thank our guest and my friend, Dr. Mike Lacona. Last but not least... I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.